Hello my lovelies and thank you so much for joining me. So very quickly for today let's think about the word in Romanian and I actually found one which I think really suits this video. So the word for today is Păcălici. 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 Well done guys, you just said trickster. Okay everyone, so I have been wanting really to do this video for ages. Now I think that since last year or perhaps around the time that Jeffrey Epstein was on trial and he has since died. He died in 2019, right? I know that this was brought up again after his death in Ghislaine Maxwell's trial, the infamous Little Black Book. And we are going to talk about that as well. And I mean, when I first read and I watched everything around Epstein and Maxwell, the Lolita Express, the, El the Elite Connections and all those juicy bits, if you will, especially the Little Black Book, now that notorious Little Black Book caught my attention significantly. Not because I don't care about the victims, of course, I do care about the victims, but I just didn't really feel like I have anything that I could add to all of the coverage already out there. But reading about the Black Book, something just clicked with something else unrelated that I personally had seen. And believe it or not, it was either on Amazon video or on that, I'm not exactly sure which one, not the Jeffrey Epstein documentary or Ghislaine Maxwell documentary or anything like that, but it was in fact a series called Harlots. You wouldn't believe how many similarities are between Harlots, the real story behind Harlots and the inspiration behind it and Jeffrey Epstein, Little Black book. Was Epstein inspired by this story or are these all coincidences? In this series let's try and find out but first to give you some context I will give you an overview of all the hassle around Jeffrey Epstein, Epstein and Ghislaine Maxwell what the Harlot series is all about and most importantly the real life origins of a legendary book dating back to years 1757-1795 Georgian London. Extremely similar in content to Epstein's Little Black Book. Had I not seen the Harlot series, I would never have made any connection in terms of similarities. Now, considering the theme of this series, I'm not sure that I will manage to fit everything in one video, hence I'm calling it a series because there's just so much information out there and I don't want to minimize the horrendous and disgusting actions of these individuals. Actually, after doing my research, I realized that I won't be able to get everything in one video, so this will be a series of more videos as far as I know from my research so far, at least four or five videos and throughout the series I will refer to Jeffrey Epstein as Jeffrey or Epstein and Ghislaine Maxwell as Ghislaine or Maxwell. I don't know guys, because, but I'm really really struggling to pronounce his uh, last name. Quite honestly, I've had to listen and listen and listen to the pronunciation and try to get it embedded in my brain that you pronounce it a certain way because me, before actually checking the pronunciation, I pronounce Epstein as Epstein, which is strikingly similar to Einstein, but is completely unrelated. So I might have instances where I'm just going to call him Epstein because that's just how I got used to pronouncing his name, but I'm going to try my best. And also, also, Ghislaine Maxwell, it just doesn't make sense to me. Ghislaine, why is he not... Giz, Gislaine, Gislaine, Ghislaine, I know that she said that she prefers to be called Ghislaine to give it sort of like a French, you know, connotation to the name. Anyway, let's carry on. 
I'm just mentioning all of these name things so you don't get confused whilst uh, you know you are watching the video and again I apologize in advance there are a handful of names on here so I'm sorry if I'm not able to pronounce all of them correctly let's start with the capo if I can call him that he was something anyway but before we do get started just a quick disclaimer I don't mean any disrespect to anyone I talk about in the video this is for educational purposes only and all the information that I'm giving you is already found in the public domain. And also there will be instances, obviously most of the instances connected to this case are instances of SA, of grooming underage children and so on and so forth. So this is your warning. If you are sensitive to such things, then perhaps this is not the video or the series for you to watch. And I will see you in the next one. Okay, let's get into it. Jeffrey Edward. Epstein was born on January 20th of 1953. He was born and raised in Brooklyn, New York City. His parents, Pauline and Seymour G. Epstein, were Jewish and they got married in 1952, shortly before Jeffrey was born. Pauline worked as a school aide and she was also a homemaker. Seymour Epstein worked for the New York City Department of Parks and Recreation as a groundskeeper and gardener. Jeffrey was the oldest of two siblings. He and his brother Mark grew up in the working class neighborhood of Seagate, a private gated community in Coney Island, Brooklyn. I haven't even finished drinking my morning coffee and I'm already getting into this kind of cases, so, so this will be an interesting day. Jeffrey attended local public schools, first attending public school 188 and then Mark Twain Junior High School nearby. He attended the National Music Camp and the, at the Interlochen Center for the Arts and he began playing the piano when he was five. Please remember this center, Interlochen Center, because it will become really important later on. He graduated in 1969 from Lafayette High School at age 16, having skipped two grades and later that year he attended classes at Cooper Union until he changed colleges in 1971. From September 1971, he attended the current Institute of Mathematical Sciences at New York University, but he left without receiving a degree in June 1974. Jeffrey Epstein started working in September 1974 as a physics and mathematics teacher for teenagers at the Dalton School on the Upper East of Manhattan. Donald Barr, who served as the headmaster until June 1974, was known to have made several unconventional recruitments at the time, although it's unclear if he had a direct role in hiring Epstein. Epstein. Oh, I'm still not comfortable pronouncing his name like this. Three months after Barr's departure, Epstein began to teach at the school despite his lack of credentials and not having a degree. Jeffrey allegedly showed inappropriate behavior towards underage students at the time. Epstein met Ellen Greenberg, the chief executive officer of Bayer Stearns, whose son and daughter were attending that school that Jeffrey was working in. Ellen's daughter, Lynn Koppel, mentioned a parent-teacher conference where Epstein influenced another Dalton parent into advocating for him to Greenberg. And then, in June 1976, after Epstein was dismissed for Dalton for poor performance, Alan Greenberg offered him a job at Bayer Stearns. Although Epstein was dismissed for poor performance, okay, that's the official thing. But, I mean, wasn't his behavior questioned at all? The inappropriate behavior towards underage students? Is this something which you kind of just brush off, especially in a school setting? Quite honestly, guys, I call it privilege and connections already, already, and we are just at the beginning of this. So now we know that Epstein, he was dismissed from Dalton School, and he now joined Bear Stearns in 1976 as a low-level junior assistant to a floor trader. He quickly moved up to become an options trader, working in the special products division, and then advised the bank's wealthiest clients, such as Seagram president Edgar Bronfman, on tax mitigation strategies. Jimmy Kane, the bank's later chief executive officer, praised Epstein's skill 
with wealthy clients and complex products and then in 1980, four years after joining Bear Stearns, he became a limited partner. Not for long though, not for very long, because in 1981, Jeffrey was asked to leave Bear Stearns for, according to his sworn testimony, being guilty of a Reg D violation. Apparently, he lent money to his closest friend and in the 1989 deposition, he said that he lent approximately $20,000 to Warren Eisenstein to buy stock and such an action would have been considered improper, although Epstein claimed he didn't realize this until afterwards. Yeah. Of course he will claim that. Even though he departed abruptly from the firm, he still remained close to Kane and Greenberg and he was a client of Bear Stearns until its collapse in 2008. And I think the collapse of Bear Stearns had something to do with him as well, but we will later touch on this as well. In August of 1981, Jeffrey founded his own consulting firm, Intercontinental Assets Group, IAG, which assisted clients in recovering stolen money from fraudulent brokers and lawyers. He described his work as being a high-level bounty hunter. He told friends that he worked sometimes as a consultant for governments and the very wealthy to recover the embezzled funds, while at other times he worked for clients who had embezzled funds themselves. Spanish actress and Harris Anna Obregon was one such wealthy client whom Epstein helped in 1982 to recover her, her father's millions in lost investments, which disappeared when Drysdale government securities collapsed because of fraud. Jeffrey also stated to some people at the time that he was an intelligence agent. During the 1980s, he possessed an Austrian passport that had his photo, but with a false name. The passport showed his place of residence in Saudi Arabia. In 2017, a former senior White House official reported that Alexander Acosta, the U.S. attorney for the Southern District of Florida, who handled Epstein's criminal case in 2008, stated to Trump transition interviewers that he was told Epstein belonged to intelligence and to just leave it alone and that Epstein was above his pay grade. Yes, quite like what I mentioned a bit earlier in the video, connections are starting to show early on in Jeffrey's life. During this time, one of Epstein's clients was the Saudi Arabian businessman Adnan Kasoji, who was the middleman in transferring American weapons from Israel to Iran as part of the Iran-Contra affair in the 1980s. Adnan was one of several defense contractors that Jeffrey knew. In the mid-1980s, Epstein traveled multiple times between the US, Europe and Southwest Asia and while in London, he met Stephen Hoffenberg. They had been introduced through Douglas Lees, a defense contractor, and John Mitchell, the former U.S. Attorney General. Stephen Hoffenberg hired Epstein in 1987 as a consultant for Towers Financial Corporation, a collection agency that bought debts people owed to hospitals, banks, and phone companies. Hoffenberg set Epstein up in offices in the Villard Houses in Manhattan and paid him $25,000 per month for his consulting work, which in 2021 was the equivalent to $60,000 per month, <laughs> per month. Hoffenberg and Epstein then refashioned themselves as corporate raiders. One of Epstein's first assignments for Hoffenberg was to implement what turned out to be an unsuccessful bid to take over Pan American World Airways in 1987. A similar unsuccessful bid in 1988 was made to take over Emory Air Freight Corporation. During this time, Hoffenberg and Epstein worked closely together and they traveled everywhere on Hoffenberg's private jet. So yeah, by the way, if I haven't mentioned it already, this video is part one of the series. In 1993, Towers Financial Corporation imploded when it was revealed as being one of the biggest Ponzi schemes in American history, losing its investors over $450 million 
equivalent to over 844 million dollars in 2021. In court documents, Hoffenberg claimed that Epstein was intimately involved in the scheme. Jeffrey left the company by 1989 and was never charged for being involved with a massive investor fraud committed. It's unknown if Jeffrey Epstein acquired any stolen funds from the Towers Ponzi scheme. So, yet again, he is being let off the hook. No wonder that he gets it in his head that he will get away with just about everything. In 1988, while Epstein was still consulting for Hoffenberg, he founded his own financial management firm, J. Epstein and Company. The company was said by him to have been formed to manage the assets of clients with more than $1 billion in net worth although others expressed skepticism that he was restrictive of the clients that he took. But I think that this was something that he was part of Jeffrey's strategy. So when you deal with billionaires and only billionaires and millionaires, you kind of get into a circle which, looking back at what Jeffrey did, it kind of made sense that he would try to find that circle so he would sell to the millionaires and billionaires his services. The only publicly known billionaire client of Epstein was Leslie Wexner, chairman and CEO of L Brands, formerly The Limited, and also Victoria's Secret. In 1986, Jeffrey met Wexner through their mutual acquaintances, insurance executive Robert Meister and his wife in Palm Beach, Florida. A year later, Jeffrey became Wexner's financial advisor and served as his right-hand man. Within the year, he had sorted out Wexner's entangled finances. In July 1991, Wexner granted Jeffrey full power of attorney over his affairs. The power of attorney allowed Jeffrey to hire people, sign checks, buy and sell properties, borrow money and do anything else of a legally binding nature on Wexner's behalf. I don't know guys, who just gives power of attorney to basically billions to someone they hardly know? Something is not quite right here and something smells quite fishy if I'm honest with you, like I like to say. But we'll get there later. By 1995, Epstein was a director of the Wexner Foundation and Wexner Heritage Foundation. He was also the president of Wexner's property, which developed part of the town of New Albany outside Columbus, Ohio, where Leslie Wexner lived. Epstein made millions in fees by managing Wexner's financial affairs. Although never employed by L Brands, he corresponded frequently with the company executives. He often attended Victoria's Secret fashion shows and hosted the models at his New York City home as well as helping aspiring models get work with the company. I mean, it's, it's kind of leading up to this though, isn't it? He gets access to girls, he gets access to billions and he keeps piling up all those connections which makes me wonder how much of all of this is actually part of a blackmail? In 1996, Epstein changed the name of his firm to the Financial Trust Company and for tax advantages, of course, based it on the island of St. Thomas in the U.S. Virgin Islands. By relocating to the U.S. Virgin Islands, he was able to reduce federal income taxes by 90 percent, 90 percent. The U.S. Virgin Islands acted as an offshore tax haven, while all the same time offering the advantages of being part of the United States banking system. Very clever, very clever. That's why all billionaires get away with it, because they cheat the system, and they are allowed to do it, but you try to do it yourself and the tax man is knocking on your door, but not on theirs. Of course, they are all untouchables. Yes. In 2003, Epstein bid to acquire New York Magazine. Other bidders included advertising executive Donnie, Donnie Deutsch, 
investor Nelson Peltz, media mogul and New York Daily News publisher Mortimer Zuckerman, and film producer Harvey Weinstein. There he is, another great name in this story, and this time to Disney. The ultimate buyer was Bruce Wasserstein, a longtime Wall Street investment banker who paid $55 million. In 2004, Epstein and Zuckerman committed up to $25 million to finance Radar, a celebrity and pop culture magazine founded by Mayor Roshan. Epstein and Zuckerman were equal partners in the venture. Roshan, as its editor-in-chief, retained a small ownership stake. It folded after three issues as a print publication and became exclusively an online one. And before we move on, I just wanted to ask you if you've noticed something. Did you notice that I kind of coordinated my earrings with Carla and her outfit? So these earrings that I have right now, these are authentic Victorian earrings with cameo, if you can see them. And of course, if you don't know already by now, Carla behind me is wearing an authentic Victorian silk day dress. So yeah, let's carry on. Epstein was the president of the company Liquid Funding Limited between 2000 and 2007. This company was an early pioneer in expanding the kind of debt that could be accepted on repurchase or the repo market, which involves a lender giving money to a borrower in exchange for securities that the borrower then agrees to buy back at an agreed upon later time. And of course price. The innovation of liquid funding and other early companies was that instead of having stocks and bonds as the underlying securities, it had commercial mortgages and, invest and investment grade residential mortgages bundled into complex securities as the underlying security. Liquid funding was initially 40%, 40% owned by Bayer Stearns. Through the help of the credit rating agencies Standard & Poor's, Fitch Ratings and Moody's Investor Service, the new bundled securities were able to be created for companies so that they got, so that they got a gold-plated AAA rating. The implosion of such complex securities because of their inaccurate ratings led to the collapse of Bear Stearns in March 2008 and set in motion the financial crisis of 2007-2008 and the subsequent Great Recession. If liquid funding were left holding large amounts of such securities as collateral, it could have lost large amounts of money. Between 2002 and 2005, Epstein invested $80 million in the DB's One Special Opportunities Fund, a hedge fund that invested in illiquid debt securities. In November 2006, he attempted to redeem his investment after he was informed of accounting irregularities in the fund. By this time, his investment had grown to $140 million. The DB's DB One fund refused to redeem the investment. Hedge funds that invest in illiquid securities, typically they have, e they have years long lockups on their capital for all investors and they require redemption requests to be made in writing 60 to 90 days in advance. The fund was closed in 2008 and its remaining assets of approximately $2 billion, including Epstein's investment, were transferred to Fortress Investment Group when that firm bought the assets in 2009. Epstein later went to arbitration with Fortress over his redemption attempt. The outcome of that arbitration is not publicly known. Of course, why would we, the plebs, need to know that? Of course not. The government began negotiation with Jeffrey for a, for a plea agreement in mid-2007 as the hedge fund began to collapse. In August of 2006, Jeffrey, a month after the federal investigation of him began, invested $57 million in the Bear Stearns high-grade structured 
Credit Strategies Enhanced Leverage Hedge Fund. Whew, wow, this was a long name. This fund was highly leveraged in mortgage-backed collateralized debt obligations, also known as CDOs. On April 18, 2007, an investor in the fund who had $57 million invested discussed redeeming his investment. At this time, the fund had a leverage ratio of 17 to 1, which meant that for every dollar invested, there were $17 of borrowed funds. Therefore, the redemption of this investment would have been equivalent to removing $1 billion from the thinly traded CDO market. Now, in uh, more general terms, I'm just going to give you a quick example. It's a, more or less like the banks work. So, for example, when you ask for a loan or even when you when you take out cash from your bank and it's a uh, and the cash uh, and you want to take out more than ten thousand pounds or ten thousand dollars i think it's in the us then you need to give notice to the bank so that the bank can prepare those money for you but the reason why you need to give that notice is because the bank doesn't exactly have those funds available from your account even though your account shows that so what the bank needs to do the bank then needs to take out money from different accounts to add up the request that you've made and that's the reason why and obviously to check on fraud and things like that and that these are the reasons that the bank will say that they need maybe 48 hours or three days notice before you can redeem uh, any amount which is larger than 10,000 I think that yeah pretty much that sums it up so basically, when you request uh, an investment uh, return to you of billions and billions, obviously that the funds won't be there straight away. So you need to make a request, in this case, 60 to 90 days, so that they can gather the funds so that they can give you the money. I think that I got it right. The selling of CDO assets to meet the redemptions that month began a repricing process and general freeze in the CDO market. The repricing of the CDO assets caused the collapse of the fund three months later in July and the eventual collapse of Bear Stearns in March 2008. It's likely Epstein lost most of this investment but of course it's not known how much of the investment was actually his. By the time that the Bear Stearns fund began to fail in May 2007, Epstein had began to negotiate a plea deal with the US Attorney's Office concerning imminent charges for SEX with underage people, with minors. In August 2007, a month after the fund collapsed, the U.S. attorney in Miami, Alexander Acosta, entered into direct discussions about the plea agreement. Acosta brokered a lenient deal, according to him, because he had been ordered by higher government officials who told him that Epstein was an individual of importance to the government. As part of the negotiations, according to the Miami Herald, Epstein provided unspecified information to the Florida federal prosecutors for a more lenient sentence and was supposedly an unnamed key witness for the New York federal prosecutors in their unsuccessful June 2008 criminal case against the two managers of the failed Bear Stearns hedge fund. So we are go, we are circling back to Bear Stearns and how he kind of went against them even though he invested in them and worked for them. In 2015, the Israeli newspaper Haaretz reported that Epstein invested in the startup Reporty Homeland Security, rebranded as Carbine in 2018. The startup is connected with Israel's defense industry. It's headed by former Israeli Prime Minister Ehud Barak, who was also at one time the defense minister and chief of staff of the Israeli Defense Forces, the IDF. The CEO of the company is Amir Eli Elihai, who was a special forces officer and Pinkas Bukris 
who is the director of the company, was at one time the Defense Ministry Director General and commander of the IDF Cyber Unit. Epstein and Barack, the head of Carbine, they were close and Epstein often offered him lodging at one of his apartment units at 301 East 66th Street in Manhattan. Epstein had past experience with Israel's research and military sector. In April 2008, he went to Israel and met with a number of research scientists and visited different Israeli military bases and during this trip, he thought about staying in Israel in order to avoid trial and possible jail for charges he was facing for SEX crimes. However, he opted to return to the US. Okay, guys, so I know that it seems like a lot of financial and investment yapping from my side, but I think it's very, very important to put into perspective just the circles that Epstein was in so that we can better understand his reach and his influence. Whew, I'm gonna take a breather here. In 2005, police in Palm Beach, Florida began investigating Epstein after a parent complained that he had as aid her 14 year old daughter. He pleaded guilty and he was convicted in 2008 by a Florida state court of procuring a child for and of soliciting a prostitute. He served almost 13 months in custody, but with extensive work he was released. Or should I say extensive knowledge of influential people? He was convicted of only these two crimes and as part of a controversial plea deal, Federal officials identified 36 girls, some as young as 14 years old, whom Epstein had allegedly as eight. I don't know. I don't even know why would you decide to offer a plea deal to him who was the mastermind of it all. No wonder that this was controversial. It shouldn't have happened to begin with. Epstein was arrested again on July the 6th, 2019 on federal charges for the SEX TRAFFICKING of minors in Florida and New York. He died in his jail cell on August the 10th, 2019. The medical examiner ruled the death a killing himself, but Epstein's lawyers disputed the ruling and there has been significant public skepticism about the true cause of his death. I i am honestly, I'm not going to talk about what others were skeptic about and you might say that it's a conspiracy theory, but him having so many intimate details about his associates and the ones who visited the island and were on board of Lolita Express, big names there, influential people from just all over the world, elite even. So I doubt that he did it to himself. He just, I doubt that he did it to himself. I think that he just knew too much for him to be allowed to leave, in my opinion. In my opinion. Because of his death, the possibility of pursuing criminal charges against him was non-existent. So then a judge dismissed all criminal charges on August 29th of 2019. And that's very convenient, isn't it? You can kind of see the pattern here, right? First, we know that he knows people. He's connected big time with the big names. Then he gets a plea deal. Then he goes to prison. He then ends his life in prison. So then the judges dismisses all the charges. I mean, what are the odds of this happening without some kind of a push? I will let you be the judge of that. And please do let me know in the comment section down below. Epstein had a decades long association with the British socialite Ghislaine Maxwell, leading to her 2021 conviction on US federal charges of SEX, TRA, FF, ICK, ING, and conspiracy for helping him procure girls, including a 14-year-old for child SA and I don't even know if I can say it on YouTube. 
Epstein also maintained long-term relationships with various high-profile individuals including Donald Trump, Leslie Wexner, Bill Clinton, Alan Dershowitz and Prince, Prince Andrew, Duke of York. Not to mention that both Epstein and Maxwell were seen at the Buckingham Palace. So yeah, high-profile individuals, I think it's quite an understatement here. And naturally, let's get into the Ghislaine Maxwell conversation. Ghislaine Noel Marion Maxwell was born on 25th of December 1961 in Maisons Lafitte, Yveline, France. She is the ninth and the youngest child of Elizabeth, a French-born scholar, and Robert Maxwell, a Czechoslovak-born British media proprietor. Her father was from a Jewish family and her mother was of Huguenot, French, Protestant descent. Ghislaine was born two days before a car accident that left her 15-year-old brother Michael in a prolonged coma until his death in 1967. Her mother later reflected that the accident had an effect on the entire family and realized that Ghislaine had shown signs of anorexia while still being a toddler. Throughout childhood, Ghislaine lived with her family in Oxford, UK at the Haddington Hill Hall, a 53-room mansion where the offices of Pergamon Press, a publishing company run by Robert Maxwell, were also located. Her mother said that all her children were brought up as Anglicans. Ghislaine studied first at Oxford High School for Girls in North Oxford and then, aged nine, was enrolled at Edgarley Hall Boarding Prep School in Somerset, followed by Haddington School at age 13. She then attended Marlborough College to study for A-levels before going on to earn a degree in Modern History with Languages from Balliol College, Oxford in 1985. She had a close relationship with her father and apparently she was his favorite. According to Tetler, Ghislaine recalled that her father installed computers at Haddington in 1973 and her first job was training to use a Wang and later programming code. The Times reported that Ghislaine, Ghislaine's father didn't allow her to bring her boyfriends home or to be seen with them publicly after she started attending Oxford University. Ghislaine Maxwell was a prominent member of the London social scene in the 1980s. She founded a women's club named after the original Kit Kat club and was a director of Oxford United Football Club during her father's ownership. She also worked at the European, a publication Robert Maxwell had established. According to Tom Bauer, writing for the Sunday Times, in 1986, Robert Maxwell invited her to the naming in her honor of his new yacht, the Lady Ghislaine, at a shipyard in the Netherlands. She spent a large amount of time in the late 1980s aboard the yacht, which was equipped with a jacuzzi, sauna, gym and disco. The Scotsman said Robert Maxwell had also tailor-made a New York company for her. The company, which dealt in corporate gifts, was really not profitable. The Sunday Times reported that Ghislaine Maxwell flew to New York on 5th of November 1990 to deliver an envelope on her father's behalf that, unknown to her, was part of a plot initiated by her father to steal $200 million from Berlitz shareholders. And again, I am going to give my view. I am really struggling to believe that Ghislaine didn't know about this plot. Yes, I know, you might argue that as a father he wanted to protect her and so he wouldn't, you know, really tell her of his illegal plans. And to some extent, in another situation, I would agree, but in this case, I really think that Ghislaine knew and I think that her father took advantage of her age, looks and of her being a young lady and so chose to use her instead of himself because let's face it and let's be honest, a young lady is much more attractive to those circles than an old guy. And also the events following convinces me that yeah, she knew and yeah, he used her. She was in her early 20s. 
After Robert Maxwell purchased the New York Daily News in January 1991, he sent Ghislaine to New York City to act as his emissary. In May 1991, she and her father took Concord on business to New York, from where he soon departed for Moscow and left Ghislaine to represent his interests at, a, at an event honoring Simon Wiesenthal. In November 1991, Robert Maxwell's body was found floating in the sea near the Canary Islands and the Lady Ghislaine yacht. Soon afterwards, Ghislaine flew to Tenerife where the yacht was docked to attend to, he, to her father's business paperwork. She attended her father's funeral in Jerusalem alongside Israeli intelligence figures, President Chaim Herzog and Prime Minister Isaac Shamir, who gave his eulogy. Although a verdict of death by accidental drowning was recorded, Ghislaine has since said that she believes her father was murdered, commenting in 1997, quote, he did not commit killing himself. That was just not consistent with his character. I think he was murdered. End of quote. And it sounds eerily familiar with Epstein's fate in prison, don't you think? Is it a coincidence or is it something else? After his death, Robert Maxwell was found to have fraudulently appropriated the pension assets of Mirror Group newspapers, a company that he ran and in which he held a large share of ownership to support his share price. Pension funds in excess of 400 million pounds were said to be missing and 32,000 people were affected. Two of Ghislaine's brothers, Ian and Kevin, who were the most involved with their father in daily business dealings, were arrested on 19th of June 1992 and they were charged with fraud related to the Mirror Group pension scandal. The brothers were acquitted three and a half years later in January 1996. Yeah, of course they were. Ghislaine Maxwell moved to the US in 1991, shortly after her father's death. She was provided with an annual income of £80,000 from a trust fund established in Liechtenstein by her father. By 1992, she moved to an apartment of an Iranian friend overlooking Central Park. At the time, she worked at a real estate office on Madison Avenue and was reported to be socializing with celebrities. She quickly rose to wider prominence as a New York City socialite. And of course, it's only natural that at one point, voila, her and Epstein connect with each other. There are different stories on when Ghislaine first met the American financier Jeffrey Epstein. According to Epstein's former business partner, Stephen Hoffenberg, Robert Maxwell introduced his daughter to Epstein in the late 1980s. The Times reported that Maxwell met Epstein in the early 1990s at a New York party following a difficult breakup with Count Gianfranco Cicogna Mozzoni of the CIGA Hotels clan. Ghislaine Maxwell had a romantic relationship with Epstein for several years in the early 1990s and they remained closely associated for more than 25 years until the time of Jeffrey's death in 2019. The nature of their relationship remains unclear. In a 2009 deposition, several of Epstein's household employees testified that he referred to Ghislaine as his main girlfriend who also hired, fired and supervised his staff starting around 1992. She has also been referred to as the lady of the house by Epstein's staff and as his aggressive assistant. In a 2003 Vanity Fair profile on Epstein, author Vicky Ward said he referred to Maxwell as his best friend. Vicky also observed that Maxwell seemed to organize much of his life. Politico reported that Maxwell and Epstein had friendships with several prominent individuals in elite circles of politics, academia, business and law, including former presidents Donald Trump and Bill Clinton, attorney Alan Dershowitz and Prince Andrew, Duke of York. 
Ghislaine Maxwell is known for her long-standing friendship with Prince Andrew and for having escorted him to a hookers and pimps social function in New York. Hookers and pimps. Quote unquote. She then introduced Epstein to Prince Andrew and the three often socialized together. In 2000, Ghislaine Maxwell and Jeffrey Epstein attended a party thrown by Prince Andrew at the Queen's Sandringham House estate in Norfolk, England, allegedly for Ghislaine Maxwell's 39th birthday. In a November 2019 interview with the BBC, Prince Andrew confirmed that Maxwell and Epstein had attended an event at his invitation, but he denied that it was anything more than a straightforward shooting weekend. Yeah, like regular people get shooting weekends with the prince. Yeah, I completely believe that. In 1995, Epstein renamed one of his companies the Ghislaine Corporation, based in Palm Beach, Florida. Now, this company was dissolved in 1998. As a trained helicopter pilot, Maxwell also transported Epstein to his private Caribbean island. In 2008, Epstein was convicted of soliciting a minor for and served 13 months of an 18-month jail sentence. Following his release, even though Ghislaine continued to attend prominent social functions, she and Epstein were no longer seen together publicly. By late 2015, Ghislaine Maxwell had largely retreated from attending social functions. Say face. Save face. Save face. Details of a civil lawsuit made public in January 2015 contained a deposition from Jane Doe III that accused Maxwell of recruiting her in 1999 when she was a minor and grooming her to provide sensual services for Epstein. A 2018 expose by Julie K. Brown in the Miami Herald revealed Jane Doe III to be Virginia Jufre, who was previously known as Virginia Roberts. She met Ghislaine at Donald Trump's Mar-a-Lago Club in Palm Beach, Florida, when Virginia was a 16-year-old spa attendant. She said that Ghislaine introduced her to Epstein, after which she was groomed by the two of them for his pleasure, including lessons in Epstein's preferences during oral gratification. Ghislaine repeatedly denied any involvement in Epstein's crimes. In a 2015 statement, she rejected allegations that she acted as a procurer for Epstein and denied that she facilitated Prince Andrew's alleged acts of SA. Her spokesperson said, quote, the allegations made against Ghislaine Maxwell are untrue, and, end of quote, and she, quote, again, strongly denies allegations of an unsavory nature which have appeared in the British press and elsewhere and reserves her right to seek redress at the repetition of such old defamatory claims." End of quote. Virginia asserted that Maxwell and Epstein T-R-A-F-F-I-C-K-E-D her and other underage girls often at SEX parties hosted by Epstein at his homes in New York, New Mexico, Palm Beach, and the United States Virgin Islands. Maxwell called Virginia a liar. Virginia then sued her for defamation in federal court in the Southern District of New York in 2015. While details of the settlement have not been made public, in May 2017 the case was settled in Virginia's favor with Ghislaine Maxwell paying Virginia millions. And quite honestly, guys, if it's a defamation trial, if there is not enough evidence, the judge dismisses the case. And in this case, I don't think that anything screams more guilt than a settlement does, quite honestly. In 2017, Sarah Ransom filed a suit in the United States District Court for the Southern District of New York against Epstein and Maxwell, alleging that Maxwell hired her to give massages to Epstein and later threatened to physically harm her or destroy her career prospects if she did not comply with their sexual demands at his mansion in New York and on his private Caribbean island, Little St. James. 
the suit was settled in 2018 under undisclosed terms, which again goes to show, in my opinion, that the allegations were true. Otherwise, why reach a settlement? On 16th of April 2019, Maria Farmer went public and filed a sworn affidavit in federal court in New York alleging that she and her 15-year-old sister Annie had been s aid by Epstein and Maxwell in separate locations in 1996. Her affidavit was filed in support of a defamation suit by Virginia Jufre against Ellen Dershowitz. According to the affidavit, Maria Farmer had met Maxwell and Epstein at the New York Art, Art Gallery reception in 1995. The affidavit says that in the summer of the following year, they hired her to work on an art project in billionaire businessman Leslie Wexner's Ohio mansion, where she was then as aide by both Maxwell and Epstein. She reported the incident to the New York Police Department and the FBI. Her affidavit also stated that during the same summer, Epstein flew her then 15-year-old sister, Annie, to his New Mexico property where he and Maxwell molested her on a massage table. Maria Farmer was interviewed for CBS This Morning in November 2019 where she detailed the 1996 assault and alleged that Maxwell had repeatedly threatened both her career and her life after the assault. On 14th of August 2019, Jennifer Araos filed a lawsuit in New York County Supreme Court against Epstein's estate, Maxwell and three unnamed members of his staff. The lawsuit was made possible under New York State's New Child Victims Act, which took effect on the same date. She later amended her complaint on 8th of October 2019 with the names of the previously unidentified women enablers to include Leslie Groff, Simberly Espinoza and the late Rosaline Fontanilla. Ghislaine Maxwell was named in one of three lawsuits filed in New York on 20th of August 2019 against the estate of Jeffrey Epstein. The woman filing the suit identified as Priscilla Doe claimed that she was recruited in 2006 and trained by Maxwell with step-by-step -step instructions on how to provide sensual services for Epstein. Any farmer, represented by David Boyce, sued Maxwell and Epstein's estate in federal district court in Manhattan, in Manhattan in November 2019, accusing them of RAPE, battery and false imprisonment and seeking unspecified damages. In January of 2020, a lawsuit was filed against Maxwell and Epstein alleging that they recruited a 13-year-old music student at the Interlocal Center for the Arts in the summer of 1994 and subjected her to S.A. The suit states that Jane Doe was repeatedly S.A.ed by Epstein over a four-year period and that Maxwell played a key role both in her recruitment and by participating in the assaults. According to the lawsuit, Jane Doe was targeted by Epstein and Maxwell for being fatherless and from a struggling family in much the same manner as many of the other alleged victims. On 12th of March 2020, Maxwell filed a lawsuit in Superior Court in the US Virgin Islands seeking compensation from Epstein's estate for her legal costs. Maxwell claimed she had been a longtime employee of Epstein from 1998 to 2006, who had served to manage his property holdings in the US Virgin Islands, New York, New Mexico, Florida and Paris, while continuing to deny any knowledge or involvement in his criminal activities. According to the lawsuit, Maxwell was seeking damages for the legal fees associated with defending herself against her accusers, expenses that she claims Epstein had promised to cover for her. <laughs> See, this kind of like, either I would call it an embedded confession or incriminating herself really, when you say that he promised he would cover her legal expenses, that means that they didn't quite do things legally, did they? In my opinion, allegedly. 
Ghislaine Maxwell was named in another civil suit filed against Epstein's estate in March 2021 by a Broward County woman who accused Epstein and Maxwell of T-R-A-F-F-I-C-K-I-N-G her after repeatedly R-A-P-I-N-G her in Florida in 2008. On 2nd of July 2019, the U.S. Court of Appeals for the Second Circuit ordered the unsealing of documents from the earlier civil suit against Maxwell by Virginia Jufra. Jeffrey Epstein was arrested on 6th of July 2019 at Teterboro Airport in New Jersey and he was charged with SEX, T-R-A-F-F-I-C-K-I-N-G and SEX, T-R-A-F-F-I-C-K-I-N-G conspiracy. That's a mouthful. Ghislaine requested a rehearing in a federal appeals court on 17th of July 2019 in an effort to keep documents sealed that were part of a suit by Jufra. On 9th of August 2019, the first batch of documents was unsealed and released from the earlier defamation suit by Jufra against Maxwell. Epstein was found dead on 10th of August 2019 after reportedly hanging himself in his Manhattan prison cell. Ghislaine Maxwell and her lawyers continued to argue against the further release of court documents in December 2019. Reuters confirmed on 27th of December 2019 that Maxwell was under investigation by the FBI for facilitating Epstein's criminal activities. Additional documents from the Jufra vs. Maxwell defamation suit were released on 30th of July 2020. The documents included a deposition given by Jufra and more recent email exchanges between Maxwell and Epstein, with some of the correspondence from 2015. On 27th of December 2019, Reuters reported that Maxwell was among those under FBI investigation for facilitating Epstein. After his arrest, Maxwell was in hiding, communicating with the courts only through her lawyers who, as of 30th of January 2020, had refused to accept on her behalf service of three lawsuits against her. The New York Times reported that by 2016, Maxwell was no longer being photographed at events. By 2017, her lawyers claimed before a judge that they did not know her address. They further stated that she was in London, but they didn't believe she had a permanent residence. Ghislaine Maxwell has a history of being unreachable during legal proceedings. During the lawsuit filed in 2017 from ransom against Maxwell, District Judge John G. Coltel granted a motion for, alterna for alternative service on the grounds that the plaintiff's efforts to reach Maxwell were pers persistently unsuccessful. These included hiring a private investigation firm that attempted service at three physical addresses, sending information to several email addresses and reaching out to the lawyers actively representing Maxwell in another lawsuit who refused to become a general agent of process to relay the information to her. According to court documents from a lawsuit filed by Epstein against Bradley Edwards, a representative for several of his accusers, in 2010 Maxwell agreed to provide a deposition in the case, but apparently she left the country one day before Edwards was scheduled to fly to New York to take her deposition, claiming that she needed to return to the UK to be with her deathly ill mother, with no intention of returning to the US. However, she returned within a month to attend Chelsea Clinton's wedding. Talk about priorities, right? In January 2020, it was reported that she had refused to allow her lawyers to be served with several lawsuits in which she has been directly named in 2019 and 2020, including one by Mary Farmer and Jennifer Arrows. While Ghislaine lawyers continue to argue on her behalf against the release of additional court documents from the Jufer versus Maxwell lawsuit, they claim they didn't know where she was, 
or to have permission to accept the lawsuits filed against her. Authorities in the United States Virgin Islands were unsuccessful in locating her during the three and a half months they were searching to serve her with a subpoena. Prosecutors consider Maxwell to be a critical fact witness in their lawsuit against Epstein's estate. A court filing from the Department of Justice released on 10th of July 2020 stated that Maxwell was also under investigation for her alleged participation in Epstein's SEX TRA FF ICK ING operation in the US Virgin Islands. Ghislaine Maxwell was arrested in Bradford, New Hampshire, United Kingdom by the FBI on 2nd of July 2020 through the use of an IMSI catcher, also known as a Stingray mobile phone tracking device on a phone used by her to call one of her lawyers, her husband Scott Borgerson and her sister Isabel. Prosecutors led by United States District Attorney Audrey Strauss charged her with six federal crimes, including enticement of minors, SEX, TRA, FFI, CKING, and perjury. The indictment alleged that between 1994 and 1997, she assisted, facilitated, and contributed to the of minor girls despite knowing that one of three unnamed victims was 14 years old. As of 28th of April 2021, Ghislaine Maxwell was held at the Metropolitan Detention Center, Brooklyn, New York. Lawyers requested that Judge Nathan release her on $5 million bond with monitored home confinement while awaiting trial. She appeared by video link before a court in Manhattan on 14th of July 2020 and pleaded not guilty to the charges. A naturalized U.S. citizen since 2002 who also holds passports from France and the U.K., she was denied bail as a flight risk with concerns regarding her completely opaque, opaque finances her skill at living in hiding and the fact that France does not extradite its citizens. The judge set a trial date of 12th of July 2021. Her attorney reiterated her request for bail on 18th of December 2020 and proposed that Ghislaine reside with a friend in New York City while under 24-hour surveillance as she awaited trial. Her husband, Scott Borgerson made a secured offer of $22 million to guarantee her presence at future appearances. On 28th of December 2020, a further request for bail was again rejected by the judge. Her bail request was opposed by alleged victim Annie Farmer. On 19th of January 2021, a court hearing was disrupted by believers in Canon, who believe Ghislaine to be working in conjunction with a cabal of child sacrificing satanist liberal elites who TRA FFIC children for SEX, as the proceedings were illegally live streamed on YouTube. On 26th of January 2021, a motion by Maxwell's attorney, attorneys challenged her grand jury indictment claiming that it did not reflect the ethnic diversity of the jurisdiction in which the violations of the law were alleged to have occurred. What does that even mean? On 29th of March 2021, US prosecutors added new charges of SEX, a minor and SEX conspiracy, alleging that Ghislaine Maxwell was involved in grooming a fourth girl, aged 14, to engage in sensual acts with Epstein between 2001 and 2004 at his Palm Beach estate. She pleaded not guilty to the additional charges. She faced six counts that included SEX of a minor and SEX conspiracy in addition to two counts of perjury. Her attorneys protested about the conditions about the conditions of her confinement, which included being kept away by a light shown in her eyes every 15 minutes to reduce the chances of her committing, killing herself and being denied a sleep mask. One, 
David Marcus protested. There's no evidence she's. They are doing it because Jeffrey because Jeffrey Epstein died on their watch. She's not Jeffrey Epstein. This isn't right. End of quote. <laughs> Ghislaine, you're in prison, my darling. Prison is prison. In April 2021, U.S. District Judge Alison Nathan ruled that Ghislaine Maxwell would face two separate trials, one for the SEX charges and another for perjury. The judge delayed the first trial to 29th of November 2021 after Ghislaine's defense, defense lawyers successfully argued that the SEX charges added in March 2021 gave them so insufficient time to investigate the new charges and prepare for trial. She appeared in court on 15th of November 2021. The trial started on 29th of November with opening statements. Psychology professor Elizabeth Loftus was called as an expert witness for the defense and provided testimony on false memory syndrome. Ghislaine chose not to testify, telling the judge, quote, Your Honor, the government has not proved its case beyond a reasonable doubt, so there is no need for me to testify, end of quote. A spokesperson for Maxwell's family had previously said she was too fragile to testify. Too fragile. There is always something, isn't it? <laughs> If it's not the conditions in prison, it's too fragile, okay. On 20th of December, as the jury completed its fourth full day of deliberation, Judge Alison Nathan said she feared jurors and trial participants might become infected with the virus and forced to quarantine, raising the possibility of a mistrial. She later said she extended the jury's hours to 6 p.m. and would also have deliberations continue through the holiday weekend until the jury reached a verdict. On 29th of December 2021, Ghislaine Maxwell was found, was found guilty and convicted by a jury in U.S. federal court on five SEX related counts carrying a potential custodial sentence of up to 65 years imprisonment. One of sex of a minor, maximum 40 years, one of transporting a minor with the, intent, with the intent to engage in criminal sensual activity, 10 years charge, and three of conspiracy to commit other felonies, 15 years in total. She was acquitted on the charge of enticing a, mi a minor to travel to engage in illegal SEX, SEX acts. The only witness to use her real name during her testimony, Annie Farmer, spoke out after the trial, saying, quote, I hope that this verdict brings solace to all who need it. Even those with great power and privilege will be held accountable when they SA and exploit the young. End of quote. A retrial was sought on the ground that the juror didn't disclose during jury selection that he had been s aid as a child. He shared the narrative of that with other jurors during the proceedings. On 1st of April 2022, the judge found that the juror's failure to disclose his as a child did not warrant a new trial and dismissed Gillian Maxwell's request to set aside the verdict. They keep trying, don't they? Ghislaine Maxwell is due to be sentenced on 28th of June 2022. She faces a second criminal trial for perjury on two charges that she lied under oath during a civil suit in 2015 about Epstein's of underage girls. Each count carries a maximum sentence of five years in prison. Prosecutors said that perjury charges will be dropped if she is sentenced on schedule. Following a petition for a new trial submitted under seal, prosecutors told the judge on 4th of February that Maxwell's arguments for a retrial must be publicly docketed. The judge said that the reason for making the submission under seal must be made public. In 2012, Ghislaine Maxwell founded the Terramar Project, a non-profit organization that advocates the protection of oceans. She gave a lecture for Terramar at the University of Texas at Dallas and a TED Talk, 
at TEDx Charlottesville in 2014. She accompanied Stuart Beck, a 2013 Terramar board member, to two United Nations meetings to discuss the project. The Terramar project announced its closure on 12th of July 2019, less than a week after the charges of SEX brought by New York federal prosecutors against Epstein became public. An associated UK-based company, Terramar UK, listed Gilles Maxwell as a director. An application for the United Kingdom organization to be closed was made on 4th of September 2019, with the first notice in the London Gazette made on 17th of September 2019. The company Terramar UK was listed as officially dissolved on 3rd of December 2019 getting rid of associations in my opinion saving face as well i think works here since at least 1997 Ghislaine maxwell has maintained a residence in belgravia london in 2000 she moved into a 7000 square feet 650 square meters townhouse on east 65th street new york city fewer than 10 blocks from epstein's mansion her townhouse was purchased for $4.95 million by an anonymous limited liability company with an address that matches the office of J. Epstein and Co. Representing the buyer was Darren Eindyke, Epstein's longtime lawyer. In April 2016, the property was sold for $15 million. Was this a payment of sort? There you go, job well done, Ghislaine, let me buy you a $50 million property <laughs> for your service. Following her personal and professional involvement with Epstein, Ghislaine Maxwell was romantically linked for several years to Ted Waite, founder of Gateway Computers. She attended the wedding of Chelsea Clinton in 2012 and in 2010 as Waite's guest. She had to wait, obtained, obtain and renovate a luxury, a luxury yacht, the Plan B, and used it for travel to France and Croatia before their relationship ended in late 2010 or early 2011. On 15th of August 2019, reports surfaced that Ghislaine had been living in Manchester by the Sea, Massachusetts, in the home of Scott G. Borgerson, a council on foreign relations fellow in residence since 2007 who in October 2020 due to the publicity surrounding Elaine stepped down as CEO of Cargo Metrics a hedge fund he founded Maxwell and Borgerson were described as having been in a romantic relationship for several years. Locals in the town of Manchester by the Sea said she kept a low profile. She went by G instead of her full first name and was seen on several occasions walking a Visla dog along the beach. Borgerson and Maxwell filed documents in Massachusetts land court about Borgerson residence known as Pippin House during a civil dispute which neighbors regard, with neighbors regarding rescinded access rights to the larger Shark's Mouth estate in 2019. A neighboring property manager attested that Maxwell and Borgerson were living together at the property in question. Others have said they were seen repeatedly running together in the mornings. Bo Borgerson stated in August 2019 that Maxwell was not currently living at the home and that he did not know where she was. On 15th of August 2019, the New York Post published photographs of Maxwell dining at a fast food restaurant in Los Angeles claiming that Quote, the post found the socialite hiding in plain sight in the least likely place imaginable, a fast food joint in Los Angeles, end of quote. The photos were later proven to have been taken at a meeting with Maxwell's friend and attorney Leah Safian, who also gave other pictures to Daily Mail. So it was kind of a set up, like a photo prop, if you will, allegedly. Ghislaine moved to a remote 156 acre, 63 hectares property in Bradford, New Hampshire, 
in late 2019 where she used former British military staff as personal security until her arrest in July 2020. At the time of her arraignment, federal prosecutors stated that Ghislaine was married. She didn't disclose the identity of her spouse or their finances. In December 2020, it emerged that she married Scott Borgerson in 2016. You know, the hedge fund founder who stepped down as a CEO where this unfolded first? I am sorry guys again, I'm sorry, I know that there is a lot of info here and it seems that I am not getting to the point of the little black book already, but I promise you, for you to be able to see it, I need to give you as many details as I possibly can, so you can see the similarities and compare. places on his properties to allegedly record sensual activity with underage girls by prominent people for, for criminal purposes such as blackmail. Ghislaine Maxwell, Epstein's close companion, told a friend that Epstein's private island in the Virgin Islands was completely wired for video and the friend believed that Ghislaine, that Ghislaine Maxwell and Jeffrey Epstein were videotaping everyone on the island as an insurance policy or blackmail in our terms. When police raided Jeffrey's Palm Beach residence in 2006, two hidden pinhole cameras were discovered in his home. It was also reported that Epstein's mansion in New York was wired extensively with a video surveillance system. Now, this kind of thing kind of throws me right back to the beginning of Epstein's career when he worked in school with no degrees and also how he managed to get power of attorney over the finances of billionaire Lexley Wexner. Wexner. I think he was blackmailed. I think it was blackmail. I'm quite sure of it, in my opinion.
Maria Farmer, an artist who worked for Epstein in 1996, was shown by Epstein a media room in the New York mansion where there were individuals monitoring the pinhole cameras throughout the house. The media room was accessed through a hidden door. She said that in the media room there were men sitting there and she looked on the cameras and she saw toilet, toilet, bed, bed, toilet, bed. She added that it was very obvious that they were like monitoring private moments. He had a lot of information on a lot of people, a lot of blackmail videos and pictures. If you look here, the limestone, inside the house, behind like a space like that, they have cameras and they have them everywhere. Jeffrey took me into a room which is a little bit back further than this window and it's leaded and it had all the computers and all these monitors, like the old fashioned TV monitors stacked. I'm looking at the monitors and I'm like, that's my room. That's the massage room. That's my shower. That's my toilet. That's everyone else's toilet in the house. That's everyone else's shower in the house. That's, that's every single corner of that house was monitored. He was watching everybody all the time. This was a blackmail scheme. All those powerful people underage girls. When he told me people owe me favors and I will never get caught, I can get away with things, he meant it. Oh my god, how sick can you be to do this kind of things? Oh my god, this, you know what guys, these millionaires and billionaires, I think that most of them have something wrong here and they believe that uh, they are entitled to do just about everything. Jeffrey Epstein allegedly lent girls to powerful people to ingratiate himself with them and also to gain possible blackmail information. According to the Department of Justice, he kept compact discs, CDs, locked in his safe in his New York mansion with handwritten labels that included the description young, name, plus name. Epstein implied that he had blackmail material when he told a New York Times reporter in 2018 of the record that he had dirt on powerful people, including information about their sensual proclivities and the recreational drug use. I mean, with the reporter, I don't know if you want to believe that is off the record, even if you say off the record, I'm quite sure that they would grasp at the opportunity to publish this or perhaps spread it you know, spread the rumor. In March 2005, a woman contacted Florida's Palm Beach Police Department and alleged that her 14-year-old stepdaughter had been taken to Epstein's mansion by an older girl. While there, she was allegedly paid $300, the equivalent to $420 in 2021, to strip and massage Epstein. She had allegedly undressed but left the encounter wearing her underwear. Palm Beach Police began a 13-month undercover investigation of Epstein, including a search of his home, and during the investigation, Palm Beach Police Chief Michael Reiter publicly accused the Palm Beach County State Prosecutor Barry Krischer of being too lenient and called for help from the FBI. The FBI then became involved. Then, the police alleged that Epstein paid several girls to perform sensual acts with him. Interviews with five alleged victims and 17 witnesses under oath, a high school transcript and other items found in Epstein's trash and home allegedly showed that some of the girls involved were under 18, the youngest being 14, with many under 16. The police search of Epstein's home found two hidden cameras and large numbers of photos of girls throughout the house, some of whom the police had interviewed in the course of their investigation.
Adriana Ross, a former model from Poland who became an Epstein assistant, allegedly removed computer drives and other electronic equipment from Epstein's Florida mansion before Palm Beach police searched the home as part of their investigation. The court documents record that the search of Epstein's residence by Palm Beach police detective Joseph Ricari in 2005 uncovered an incriminating Amazon receipt containing books on S and M. The books he ordered are titled SM 101, a, realis a realistic introduction, slave craft, roadmaps for erotic servitude, principles, skills and tools and training with Miss Abernathy, a workbook for erotic slaves and their owners. This sounds so disgusting, so disgusting, only the title, seriously, bondage, s and these kind of things. Eventually, the FBI compiled reports on 34 confirmed minors eligible for restitution, which was increased to 40 in the non-prosecution agreement, whose allegations of SA by Epstein including corroborating details. Julie Brown's 2018 expose in the Miami Herald identified about 80 victims and located about 60 of them. She quoted the then police chief writer as saying, this was 50 something she's and one he and the she's all basically told the same story. Details from the investigation included allegations that 12-year-old triplets were flown in from France for Epstein's birthday and flown back the following day after being essayed by him. It was alleged that the young girls were recruited from Brazil and other South, South American countries, former Soviet countries and Europe and that Jean-Luc Brunel's MC2 modeling agency was also supplying girls to Epstein. In May of 2006, Palm Beach police filed a probable cause affidavit saying that Epstein should be charged with four counts of unlawful SEX with minors and one count of SA. On July 27, 2006, he was arrested by the Palm Beach Police Department on state felony charges of procuring a minor for prostitution and solicitation of a prostitute. He was booked at the Palm Beach County Jail and he was later released on a $3,000 bond. State Prosecutor Krischer later conv convened a Palm Beach County grand jury which was usually only done in capital cases. Presented evidence from only two victims, the grand jury returned a single charge of felony solicitation of prostitution to which Epstein pleaded not guilty in August 2006. Epstein's defense lawyers included Roy Black, Gerald Lefcourt, Harvard Law School professor Alan Dershowitz and former U.S. Solicitor General Ken Starr. Linguist Steven Pinker also assisted. So these were the best of the best, if you will. In July 2006, the FBI began its own investigation of Epstein, nicknamed Operation Leap Year. This resulted in a 53-page indictment in June 2007. Alexander Acosta, then the U.S. Attorney for the Southern District of Florida, agreed to a plea deal, which Alan Dershowitz, Dershowitz helped to negotiate to grant, listen to this, to grant immunity from all federal criminal charges to Epstein along with four named co-conspirators and any unnamed potential co-conspirators. According to the Miami Herald, the non-prosecution agreement essentially shut down an ongoing FBI probe into whether there were more victims and other powerful people who took part in Epstein's SEX crimes. At the time, this halted the investigation and this also sealed the indictment. The Miami Herald said, and I quote, Acosta agreed, despite a federal law to the contrary, that the deal would be kept from the victims, end of quote. Acosta later said that he offered a lenient plea deal because he was told that Epstein belonged to intelligence, was above his pay grade, and to leave it alone. Epstein agreed to plead guilty in Florida State Court to two felony prosecution 
charges, serve 18 months in prison, register as a SEX offender and pay restitution to three dozen victims identified by the FBI. The plea deal was later described as a sweetheart deal. According to an internal review conducted by the Department of Justice's Office of Professional Responsibility, which was released in November 2020, Acosta showed poor judgment in granting Epstein a non-prosecution agreement and failing to notify Epstein's alleged victims about this agreement. On June 30, 2008, after Epstein pleaded guilty to a state charge, one of two of procuring for prosecution, a girl below age 18, he was sentenced to 18 months in prison. While most convicted SEX offenders in Florida are sent to state prison, Epstein was instead housed in a private wing of the Palm Beach County Stockade and according to the Sheriff's Office was after three and a half months allowed to leave the jail on work release for up to 12 hours a day six days a week. This contravened the sheriff's own policy requiring a maximum remaining sentence of 10 months and making SEX offenders ineligible for the privilege. He was allowed to come and go outside of specified release hours. His cell door was left unlocked and he had access to the attorney room where a TV was installed for him before he was moved to the stockade's previously unstaffed infirmary. He worked at the office of a foundation he created shortly before reporting to jail. He dissolved it after he served his time. The sheriff's office received $128,000 from Epstein's non-profit to pay for the costs of extra services being, providing, being provided during his work release. His office was monitored by permit deputies whose overtime was paid by, guess who? Epstein, of course. They were required to wear suits and checked in, welcome guests at the front desk. The front desk. Later, the sheriff's office said that these guest logs were destroyed per the department's records retention rules, even though the stockade visitor logs were not. Epstein was allowed to use his own driver to drive him between jail and his office and other appointments. There you go. This was Epstein in prison and privileges. The elite is always above the law and they even buy the law. They pay to buy the law. Epstein served almost 13 months before being released on July 22nd, 2009 for a year of probation on house arrest until August 2010. While on probation, he was allowed numerous trips on his corporate jet to his residences in Manhattan and the US Virgin Islands. He was allowed long shopping trips and to walk around Palm Beach for exercise. <laughs> yes, because all the ones who are on probation and on house arrest are allowed to do that. Yes. After a contested hearing in January 2011 and an appeal, he stayed registered in New York State as a level 3 high risk of repeat offense SEX offender, a lifelong designation. At that hearing, the Manhattan District Attorney argued unsuccessfully that the level should be reduced to a low risk level, level 1 and was rejected by the judge. Despite opposition from Epstein's lawyer that he had a main home in the US, Virgin Islands, the judge confirmed he personally must check in with the New York Police Department every 90 days. Though Epstein had been a level 3 registered SEX offender in New York since 2010, the New York Police Department never enforce the 90-day regulation, even though non-compliance is a felony. But you know that when you have money, you are above it all. Yes, the law doesn't apply to you anymore, does it? Because you kind of give the money in the right places, yeah? The immunity agreement and his lenient treatment were the subject of ongoing public dispute. Oh, well, of course it would be. 
The Palm Beach police chief accused the state of giving him preferential treatment and the Miami Herald said that U.S. attorney Acosta gave Epstein the deal of a lifetime. Following his arrest in July 2019 on SEX charges, Acosta resigned as Secretary of Labor effective July 19, 2019. If he would have resigned, from my point of view, he would probably be kicked out. And I think he resigned a much richer man than he was, in my opinion. I didn't look at his finances and I, I don't really like looking into people's finances in general, but that's my assumption anyway. After the accusations became public, several people and institutions returned donations that they received from Epstein, including Elliot Spitzer, Bill Richardson and the Palm Beach Police Department. Harvard University announced it would not return any money. Various charitable donations that Epstein made to finance children's education were also questioned. On 18th of June 2010, Epstein's former house manager Alfredo Rodriguez was sentenced to 18 months incarceration after being, con after being convicted on an obstruction charge for failing to turn over to police and then trying to sell a journal in which he recorded Epstein's activities. FBI Special Agent Christina Pryor reviewed the material and agreed it was information that would have been extremely useful in investigating and prosecuting the case, including names and contact information of material witnesses and additional victims. On 6th of February 2008, an anonymous Virginia woman known as Jane Doe No. 2 filed a 50 million dollar civil lawsuit in federal court against Epstein saying that when she was a 16 year old minor in 2004-2005 she was recruited to give Epstein a massage. She claimed she was taken to his mansion where he exposed himself and had sensual intercourse with her and paid her $200 immediately afterwards. A similar $50 million suit was filed in March 2008 by a different woman who was represented by the same lawyer. These and several similar lawsuits were dismissed. All other lawsuits have been settled by Jeffrey Epstein out of court. He made many out of court settlements with alleged victims, which just goes to show how he screams guilt. Mm. If he would be in front of me. A December 30th, 2014, federal civil suit was filed in Florida by Jane Doe 1, known now as Courtney Wilde, and Jane Doe 2 against the United States for violations of the Crimes Victim of the Crime Victims Rights Act by the US Department of Justice's non-prosecution agreement with Epstein and his limited 2008 state plea. There was later an unsuccessful effort to add Virginia Roberts, Jane Doe 3, and the other woman, Jane Doe 4, as plaintiffs to that case. The addition accused Ellen Dershowitz of essaying a minor, Jane Doe 3, provided by Epstein. The allegations against Dershowitz were stricken by the judge and eliminated from the case because he said they were outside the intent of the suit to reopen the plea agreement. A document filed in court alleges that Epstein ran an SA ring and lent underage girls to prominent American politicians, powerful business executives, foreign presidents, a well-known prime minister, and other world leaders. On April the 7th, 2015, Judge Kenneth Mara ruled that the allegations made by alleged victim Virginia Roberts against Prince Andrew had no bearing on the lawsuit by alleged victims seeking to reopen Epstein's non-prosecution plea agreement with the federal government. The judge ordered that allegation to be struck from the, re to be struck from the record. Judge Mara made no ruling as to whether claims by Virginia Roberts are true or false. Even though he didn't allow Jane Doe 3 and 4 to join the suit, Mara specifically said that Roberts may later give evidence 
when the case comes to court. On February 21st, 2019, in the case of two Jane Doe's v. United States, senior judge of the U.S. District Court for the Southern District of Florida, Kenneth Mara, said federal prosecutors violated the law by failing to notify victims before they allowed him to plead guilty to only the two Florida offenses. The judge left open what the possible remedy could be. In a December 2014 Florida court filing by Bradley Edwards and Paul G. Castle meant for inclusion in the Crime Victims' Rights Act lawsuit, Virginia Jufer, Jufre, then known as Virginia Roberts, alleged in a sworn affidavit that at age 17 she had been sensually by Epstein and Ghislaine and Ghislaine Maxwell for their own use and for use by several others, including Prince Andrew and retired Harvard law professor Alan Dershowitz. Virginia also claimed that, that Epstein, Maxwell and others had physically and as aid her. She alleged that the FBI may have been involved in a cover-up. She said she served as Epstein's SEX slave from 1999 to 2002 and recruited other underage girls. Prince Andrew, Epstein and Dershowitz all denied having had SEX with her, of course. Dershowitz took legal action over the allegations. Virginia filed a defamation suit against Dershowitz, claiming he on purpose made false and malicious defamatory statements about her. A diary alleged to belong to Virginia was published online. Epstein entered an out-of-court settlement with her as he had done so in several lawsuits. Oh, that's, that was a lot of information and having said all that, uh, I will end the video for today, part one of this uh, series and I will leave you to sit down and think of it and think on it as well and also like I mentioned, it will be, it will be, uh, there will be a lot of videos in this series, at least four. So we will not get yet to the point of the little black book, simply because I want to give you all the information first, so that you can compare everything that we know from him and Maxwell, and all the things that have been happening, and the true story behind. Harlots, the little black book and the original story of the book from the 1700s. And please also keep in mind on this occasion, the book from the 1700s, we also know that Ghislaine Maxwell, for example, she studied, she studied the history in school. So actually she had a degree in history, I believe, in modern history and such. And my assumption is that as a part of history, you would learn about uh, British history because the little black book and the, the original little black book is actually uh, original from Britain and also uh, there's also another story which is a real story in Britain of the um, I think is the the ladies of the Covent Garden something similar to that yes which I think that also can be included in the little black book in the harlots and um, in all the things that these people have been doing in this case so stay tuned thank you so much for watching today's video i will see you in the next uh, in part two of this series where we will carry on talking about all the connections that we can find and yeah for now thank you so much for watching i have a patreon if you are interested in it uh, it's 18 plus it has three tiers uh, we talk there about stuff that we can't talk on YouTube for obvious reasons there will be crimes in photos and other things if you want to check it out the link will be in the description down below and also on your screen also if you are not subscribed please consider subscribing by hitting the subscribe button uh, and hitting the notification bell as well so you are notified of any new uploads and also it would be really helpful if uh, and I would really appreciate it if you guys could give this video a thumbs up it really helps me and my channel out and it helps with YouTube in spreading the video on the platform and really bringing awareness to the video and to the channel. Thank you so much again. Please take care and stay safe and I will see you in the next one. Bye! Wow, wow, wow.